On today's show, we have Felix Hartman, the managing partner at Hartman Capital. Hartman Capital is a digital and crypto asset management firm combining an institutional approach with a startup mindset. He's also the founder of CryptoAcademy.us and council member at Enzyme Finance. We're going to discuss details about his fund, portfolio construction, underwriting projects, and more. Felix, thanks for coming on today. Why don't you start by giving us some background? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, look forward. Yeah, so my name is Felix Hartman. I got into the crypto space fairly early. Initially, I just started by trading you know, equities and derivatives back in 2012, 2013. Did my first analyses on Bitcoin back in 2014. Then had a little trading hiatus where I joined a startup as the CEO. And funny enough, that startup had integrations with Coinbase and BitPay as early as like 2015. This was post Mt. Gox when, you know, for those that know Mt. Gox, Mt. Gox was the biggest exchange doing like 80% of Bitcoin volume. And they essentially went bankrupt, right? So they even lost a lot of people's money, after which Bitcoin you know, collapsed from about 1500 down to $200. And it stayed there for a very long time, right? So people are very familiar with the bear market of 20. 18, but many forget that there was many bear markets before, such as the one in around 2013, 2014. So right around the time when we, you know, with through the startup worked with Coinbase and BitPay briefly, A, they started listing Ethereum, right? And B, Bitcoin started coming back out of nowhere, right? So Bitcoin was down to $200. It started climbing 600, 700. And Ethereum, literally, I think around January 1st of 2017, Ethereum was worth like $8, right? It was a single digit. And the trader in me woke up again, where I said, look, this is a multi-year breakout. And when a multi-year breakout happens, there's usually a catalyst, there's something happening. And a couple of things were happening. I think one of the leading factors was the proper launch of smart contracts in the beginning of ICOs, right? 2016, you had the first ICOs with, I think, Augur, Mellon, and a few others. And people start seeing like, hey, there's something there, right? There's a whole new funding model. And the side part of a lot of funding is you're able to hire more talent. And if you hire more talent, there's more innovation, right? So I jumped early, you know, and made my full-time trading crypto back in 2017. That was a weird thing to say, like I'm a full-time crypto trader. I had actually sit downs with a few friends where I said, listen, there's this crazy opportunity. Like, you got to hear me out. I'm quitting the startup, right? I had a CEO position, I was paying everything. And like, we were doing well. I was like, I'm quitting the startup. I'm going all in on this and you should find a way to do it too. Nobody took the lead, unfortunately, for them. But you know, I, I went full time, did really well for myself, and that ultimately led to people saying, "Hey, why don't you invest for me?" And it took a lot of times where I said, "No, no, no," you know, I don't want to deal with this. Just being so much demand, and especially one very big offer that I received in the eight figures, where I then said, "Hey, now you're being stupid, not looking into how to set up a fund, right? To do this." So the next day, pretty much, I set up a hedge fund. I looked up, you know, how to start a hedge fund. I found three lawyers offering security services and I incorporated the fund. And from then on, the journey started. You think setting up the fund is a big part. No, that's the easy part. The harder <laughs> part is to then actually raise money. That's also actually an easier part. The hard part then is like, you know, managing it over the years, right? Actually building a firm, going from solo manager that just, you know, like clicks buttons and invests to actually building a firm where you have analysis processes, risk management processes, you know, actually build a brand, for the investment firm itself, where you know people find you and where teams, that's, the, that's, the, that's I think the real kicker, where teams want to work with you, where like the projects you're investing in, you're not begging for an allocation, but it's the roles are reversed where maybe they even give you a discount. They say like, look, we want to have you on the cap table. We want to work with you. Let's make a deal, right? And that's been like the process of the last three years going from solo fund, founder, you know, running it from a bedroom essentially to now running a firm with more than 10 full-time employees, a lot of assets can't comment on those publicly because of the way we're filed and yeah, just having seen tremendous growth. What was the date that you guys initial formation was? That was 18, right? So February 18, February 18, we incorporated takes a long time to actually get going because back in 2018 it was impossible to get a crypto bank account. Yeah. The only one that worked with you was Silvergate and they were so backed up. They literally took months to onboard you. So there was months of onboarding for banks, admins, auditors crypto exchanges back then also coinbase was so understaffed that like there was a two month wait period three month wait period sometimes to get an account going all right so you guys started in 18 and what was your initial team and how did you kind of form those first few people when i first started like launch it was just me 
right? So initially it was trust me, but I was also, I was a key investor. So in, and even today, even today, 20% of the fund is me, right? It's my own money. So I continue to be the largest investor and I continue to be the most recurring investor, which, you know, it's A, it's a good signal, but B, it was a really important choice for me to make because that allows me to do what I think is right, right? So I'm never at the whim of any kind of like key investor, which I think a lot of funds struggle with or suffer from. Because in the crypto space particularly, I think you you found that the best performers tend to be prop shops. The second best performers tend to be funds that have like a large stake by management. And then it starts getting a lot more diluted when you need to, you, when you feel the need to cater towards preferences of specific investors. This space is so fast moving that you, you cannot play too defensive on the thesis front, right? In crypto, you're very handsomely rewarded for taking counter market theses. So for example, back in 2020, like last year, right? In the early summer of last year, almost every crypto fund out there was primarily invested to Bitcoin and maybe some ETH. Investing into anything else at that point was almost like frowned upon as like, oh, too risky. You're gambling with shit coins. But the reality was the funds that had the bravery to say, hey, DeFi is, is a huge innovation and we want to allocate to it. They did phenomenally well because they, DeFi some was what really took off. Same thing goes, you know, for those funds and on the NFT fund, I'll say like we, we didn't invest into NFTs directly, but we did invest into like, you know, infrastructure like Decentraland and all the different NFT marketplaces and so forth. But, you know, if we said, hey, I know like investing in NFTs is kind of like very counterintuitive, right? But if you bought CryptoPunks last year, you did incredibly well, right? So I think it's important for crypto funds to, while we're on this, and this is a funny thing, you know, on one hand, when this road to institutionalization, right? You want to become more institutional. You want to become more and more bringing a lot of the good sides from, let's say, Wall Street, really meaning good reporting practices, you know, like timely reporting practices, you know, good risk management, right? And risk management, both from the market perspective, but also from the operational perspective, right? Good communications, right? All the, all the kind of things that Wall Street does well, but I think we have to be careful not to adopt the negative, which is this kind of like middle of the bell curve behavior, where now that you're, you're so worried about, you know, catering to large allocators that you start saying, oof, NFTs, I don't know, you know what, this is all just bullshit, right? No, like you should actually take the time to understand that segment, right? You should take the time to look at, you know, Axie Infinity, a, a video game. Why would anybody bet on a video game? Well, now it's worth like, you know, $20, $30 billion, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I think this is a very natural progress that can happen with firms. And I think the best firms can stay in touch with what made them start and made, made them be great initially, right? Because I think every fund kind of goes to like an S-curve, right? Where it's very hard at the start. Nobody wants to invest in you when you have no track record. Nobody wants to back you. And then you hit that like golden time when there's enough size, but you're still young enough where you can make those bold bets. And then you become so big, you know, you're like multi-billion dollars now, where now, A, there's only so many places you can allocate to. And number two, at this point, you're probably managing money off like, you know, endowments and maybe like sovereign nations, you know, you, you never know. And at that point, you become so risk averse that you're just doing the very basic things because you know, oh, well, as long as I keep making management fees and like some performance on billions of dollars, it doesn't matter, right? But I think if you love the art of investing, particularly in emerging tech, at least personally, I, I never want to lose that, right? Which is, yeah, it's just like, it takes some self-honesty and like staying invested in the fund yourself. With so many different opportunities in the market, like you mentioned, NFTs, DeFi, gaming, what is your fund's thesis and how do you kind of make those decisions? Are you guys also going very broad or are you trying to stay concentrated? Great question. So, so over the years, I always say there is, there's the strategy bucket and then there's the analysis bucket, right? So looking at the analysis first, from analysis perspective, we're very thematic because the crypto space itself is a thematic space that I think it's very unlike any other out there. And when I say thematic for those that are new to crypto, it just means that let's say five years ago, there was just crypto. Three years ago, people start segmenting with Bitcoin and altcoins, right? That was a very lazy way. And, and back then there was something called altcoin seasons, alt seasons, right? Then over the last two years, 18 months, maybe this altcoin bucket started splitting off where there's multiple sub sectors, sub themes, for example, DeFi. Now, like for some reason, this crypto loves seasons, right? There was DeFi <laughs> summer, right? Last summer, there was a season called DeFi summer where every DeFi project essentially 10x, 20x, ab absurd returns. Meanwhile, Bitcoin didn't do anything, right? So these are like idiosyncratic rallies of specific themes or specific sectors. And we've gone from altcoins to now DeFi, metaverse. And even within metaverse, you could say there's play to earn gaming and there's NFTs, right? There's multiple sub segments now. And so from these themes, we try to identify, you know, what's the next move? What is the next theme 
that the market will wake up to pay attention to. And to me right now, you know, we allocate to five core themes, which is one DeFi, you know, decentralized finance. That one has hit the mainstream fairly well. Same thing goes for the metaverse. So DeFi and metaverse are two of the five themes we allocate to. Again, both, I think, have hit the mainstream. People are somewhat familiar with them at this point. DeFi was on the cover of Fortune magazine at this point. The metaverse is in the news every single day with, you know, Snoop Dogg launching NFTs, Dolce Gabbana launching NFTs. I mean, it's really hit the zeitgeist right now. I think, you know, NFTs is probably one of the core cultural topics of 2021. So those are two themes we allocate with the flagship fund. And then three more themes we allocate to as well are the decentralized web, so we call it D-Web. What that stands for essentially is decentralizing the entire internet experience. So the reason why Bitcoin is so strong is because no government in the world, no bank in the world could ever do something against it if they wanted to. Many, many, many wanted to shut it, shut it down. China seems to want to shut it down, but there's nothing they can do. Bitcoin keeps running, right? Even when China had it banned, there was like major investments coming from China because again, there's only so much you can do. So what needs to happen is that all this decentralized tech fully decentralizes. So right now you have decentralized finance like DeFi, right? Like decentralized exchanges and the backend code is actually decentralized like Bitcoin is. The problem though, is that the front ends, you know, like the actual dot coms that you go to, they're living on centralized servers like Amazon, right? So what DWeb does is it decentralizes the infrastructure itself so that you have decentralized hosting, like website hosting. You have decentralized online storage, decentralized cloud computing, decentralized DNS, like the domain name servers, like the, the dot coms, because there have been times, even though they've been highly political, things like I think 8chan was literally taken down from the internet. Like you can no longer reach it because they took down the domain name, right? And so that you can do that through platforms like, you know, Helium does broadband, Handshake does DNS, you know, you have ARWeave doing storage. ARWeave actually had a really compelling story recently where the Chinese authorities wanted to shut down the Apple Daily News office in Hong Kong. And the writers there uploaded the stories to ARWeave where the government could no longer erase them, right? So now you have this way in, and this is so beautiful because it's, I'm really big into dystopian fiction so much that I even wrote one myself is, is that Books like 1984 or Fahrenheit, I think 451, you know, there's one of the common themes in the dystopian fiction is book burning and changing the past, right? With things like AR Weave, you know, that becomes a thing of the past, so to say. You know, that fear can go away because even if an authoritarian government wants to remove information, they can no longer do so with proper decentralized technologies. Anyway, so that was the third theme. Fourth theme would be privacy. One of the main reasons we invest in private infrastructure is that everything you do on blockchain today is fully transparent. Ethereum, Bitcoin, same thing. If I send you Ethereum from my wallet, you now know the public key to my wallet and you can see anything I've ever done, right? And that's just unthinkable when you think in traditional finance, because if you go to a restaurant and you swipe a credit card, do you really want the restaurant to know everything you've ever done? We as a culture, were always so afraid and so fighting against like, you know, Facebook's advertising practices and Facebook's privacy practices. Now imagine that every counterparty that you ever do a transaction with knows everything you've ever done. Uh, it's unthinkable. And sometimes people say, oh, but people don't care that much about privacy. You know, like this is just like a, a libertarian ideal. That's why I have to break privacy down into like, you know, three perspectives. One, yes, it's the libertarian that wants privacy from the government. Okay, that's one bracket. Bracket two is the average person. Does the average teenager, a 20 year old, really want their parents to see every transaction they ever do? No, right? Do you really want, you know, so much is like keeping up with the Joneses. Imagine all those keeping up with the Joneses people. If all their neighbors would know their bank account balance, right? <laughs> you know, all of a sudden that fancy car in the driveway doesn't look that cool when the wallet is empty, right? So like, you know, people want some kind of level of privacy even from each other in a totally non-criminal way, in a totally not anti-government way, just literally from each other, right? And then the third privacy need is actually institutional. Or if we do say that DeFi goes global. And if the whole world operates on DeFi, it's unthinkable that every large and major institution is transparent. You know, every time Bridgewater, Rentec, or some of the big funds in the world make a single purchase, right? They would leak it to the entire world. They're like, oh, Rentec just started buying shares of this. Oh, Bridgewater just started, or BlackRock, you know, is starting to purchase this and that, right? Yes, there's filings right now, but those filings are incredibly slow, right? They have them, like on a quarterly basis. In DeFi and on blockchain, it's real time, meaning if one single block goes out and they purchase something, 
it's literally signal to the whole world. And, and this is happening in the crypto space already where there's a platform called Nansen where you can literally track other crypto funds. So it's like, oh, Alameda's buying something, might want to jump in on that too, right? Oh, three arrows is dumping something, better get out before they dump the rest of the tokens, right? And that becomes an actual financial risk, so to say, where then people might say, you know what? Yes, I am willing to pay money for the privacy of my transactions. So that's the privacy theme. And then last but not least, Web3. The reason I differentiate between Web3 and DWeb, DWeb is infrastructure. Web3 are like layer ones like Ethereum, right? So Ethereum, Terra, Solana, that kind of bucket, right? Where we say this is the next internet, the backend of the next internet. Uh, that, you know, in the past, people used to call it like, you know, it's like an operating system. Those we allocate to as well, because it's becoming more and more clear that the world will be multi-chain rather than just Ethereum. So we're betting on some potential competitors that might take market share. So there's definitely you know a handful of themes there. And I know that there's thousands of tokens out there. Mm-hmm. So what's some of the first things that you do to kind of identify some positions that you're going to look at for the portfolio? Right. And I think that's where the themes help as well, because, you know, let's say you first arrive at the doors of coin market cap or CoinGecko and you see the number at the top left. Oh, you know, there's, there's 12,000 coins out there. Right. Where do you start? So that's where the themes are great, because now all of a sudden you conceptualize this whole market. You said, OK, now we've got different buckets. OK, so let's start simple. You know, let's go to DeFi. Who are the biggest players in DeFi? Or like you can either go by that or what I even prefer more. Let's attack DeFi. You know, what are some things that still need to happen? Right. So, for example, let's say three months ago, we said, look, DEXs, that space is saturated. You already have so many decentralized exchanges, so many AMMs. There's no shortage of them. Right. And now there's so many copycats. Right. Same thing goes for yield aggregators and lenders. But, you know, something that still hadn't gone mainstream was futures exchanges. Right. Decentralized futures. And you might even attack them even more so by saying, hey, right now, Binance is kicking off U.S. customers. They're kicking off even Europeans from using futures. So there will be demand for decentralized futures. All right, so we, we got our DeFi bucket. We go even a little bit closer. We say, hey, decentralized futures is what we're curious about. Let's look at every single one, right? So you research what exists out there. You've got DYDX, you've got Perp, you've got MCDEX, you've got FutureSwap, you've got GMX, you've got Vega, you've got, you know, so you, we, we basically go down the list and we literally like, you know, we start big, right? Crypto market, go smaller, DeFi, go smaller, decentralized futures. And then we literally look at everyone and I could just, you know, name like eight off the top of my head and I'm sure there's more, but we review every single one to identify our champion, so to say. And we say, look, this project is more than likely going to dominate the decentralized futures market. And then we make an allocation, right? And so we do, we, we do that for all, every single micro segment. So that way our portfolio is composed of champions in every single little side category. And that way there's very little overlap. It's certainly not spray and gray, right? You know, and we, we do end up with a large book. So right now we hold perhaps 40 different assets, but every single asset is hand selected. that says like, okay, we got a winner in uh, decentralized futures, in decentralized insurance, in decentralized debt tranches. And then that, that's just DeFi, right? Then we've got metaverse. Well, we, we want to have a, our champion in play to earn. We want to have our champion in NFT marketplaces. We want to have our champion in fractionalizing NFTs, right? And then privacy, we've got, you know, you know, for example, like Secret Network doing a native privacy, right? It's its own, it's an entirely private chain for small contracts. And then we got another uh, investment like Railgun that does privacy on Ethereum. So whether or not we go multi-chain or stay on ETH, we got to play in both. So that's kind of how we go about portfolio construction. Now, do you guys have any market cap restrictions to kind of your entry and what you're putting in the portfolio? Sure. Our sweet spot really has been the 10 to $50 million market cap range, which takes a lot of digging, takes a lot of find. <laughs> especially now. Oh yeah, especially now. But they do exist if you're always kind of like one step ahead. So for example, like if you're trying to find a $10 million DeFi product in the middle of DeFi summer, you're going to have a hard time, right? But if you look for it on a pullback, you have a much better chance. Same thing goes for metaverse. You know, you're going to have a hard time finding a $10 million metaverse project in the middle of the hottest, you know, metaverse summer or whatever. But it's possible if you look for it outside of that, right? So that's why we look at stuff like DWeb and privacy, because quite frankly, other than us, there's very few people paying attention to it, which allows you those better prices. However, if, if there is a product that has incredible traction, that is a market leader, I'm not afraid to pay premium. I'd much rather pay a premium for the winner than get a deal on number two or three, right? So there's many times where we do back the underdog, but it's because we, we believe that they're actually mispriced because we actually think they're better than number one. But I think a lot of people actually make the mistake in investing that they're not willing to pay the premium. Best example is you say, ooh, Bitcoin's too expensive. I'm going to buy bird coin instead you know that was like a, a currency back back in 2017 you know yeah you would have done horribly if you backed bird coin you'd have did great buying bitcoin right so market cap itself i think only matters in two ways one 
for comps by comparing it to other assets in that specific market segment and saying, is this fairly priced compared to the rest there? And then secondly, realistically speaking, over a five to 10 year horizon, if it actually succeeds at what it aims to do, where's the equity market's comparable limit? So that's why, for example, I'm not that interested in axes right now at a 30 billion market cap. And this might be completely the wrong take five years from now. But when you compare it to the real world, it, I think it just flipped EA games. It just flipped EA games and is now, I think, the fifth or sixth or seventh most valuable game company in the world. Does it really deserve to be there? Sorry, I, I, I personally don't think at this current place in time, I think there is there is a lot of traction. They're making a lot of money. It's, it's a great project, but it's still really, really early. And games are like fashion. They, they come and go in trends, right? Pokemon Go was the hottest thing in the world in 2016, where there was swaths of people running across the streets to play Pokemon Go. And now nobody talks about Pokemon Go anymore, right? So I think you have to take a little bit of a different approach depending on what you're investing in. NFTs and gaming is very different than financial products, right? You do get bored of a game. You do get bored maybe of a piece of art sometime. You don't get bored of your bank infrastructure or your broker, right? So like, like it's not like, Ugh, I don't like TD anymore. I'm going to go to Charles Schwab now, right? It's like, does it do its job? Yes. Is it the best at doing its job? Yes. Great. You know, but with a game, there's, there's just more factors that go into it. It has to stay fresh. So you guys, so basically what you said is that you guys are looking at stuff in each theme and breaking it down no. and then looking for something, I guess we'll call it under a hundred million dollar market cap, right? That would be the ideal. Yeah. Because ultimately it's, it's opportunity cost. This market has so many different innovations happening at the same time. There's many times when I say, this is a good product. This would be a good investment, but there's also better ones, right? So it's like, I know I'll make money on this, but is it is it only a 2X over two years? Then it's probably not that interesting because there are plenty of plays out there that can offer potential 10, 20X returns. After you acquire that position, kind of what is your strategy? Are you looking at just holding that for a certain period of time, five years? Can you kind of go into that? Oh, no. So because we're a liquid hedge fund, I think our holding period is usually seasonal. So like I would say three months, six months, if it's a high conviction position, uh, it can be longer, right? It could be some positions we've held for a year and a half now, right? But if it's if it's that long, right, it, you always have to reassess like how much multiples left because every single day that you hold is essentially a decision to repurchase, right? There, there are, of course, things that motivate longer holding. Like, for example, if you say, hey, I still think this has a lot of room to go compared to others. That way, by not selling, A, I do not realize a capital gain. And also, you remove the risk of like trying to time the markets. So that's why actually this portfolio construction helps quite a bit by having 40 assets. You can let assets triple, quadruple without them causing too much of a portfolio concentration. Because if something starts at 3% and it triples, well, it's now 9%. 9% is still no threat. I think an asset can become a portfolio threat when it goes to 20% or higher, because at that point, a 50% drawdown can cause a 10% AUM shrinking. So that's that's roughly how I look at it. The way we get active with these projects, like first of all, you know, we have our analysts, we always meet for presentations twice a week. Like for example, today where every analyst covers like two projects a week and we do a deep dive. And let's say we cover 12 a week, maybe we like one or two. We say, hey, this is something we really want to take a close look at. Now part of our analysis is actually talking with the founders. So almost every project that we allocate to, we do have, we have a face-to-face, we assume nowadays, with the founders, get to know them better and ask the questions that we just couldn't get answered online. Sometimes they, they're really bad on like being clear on like traction numbers. Right. So a lot of times like projects don't show like how many people have actually used this. What's the actual transaction volume? And that helps a lot. And then if we do really like it, you know, we get involved, we, we invest. And then we do one of two things, either passively, either because the, the team is smart and strong enough to do it on their own, or maybe they don't want our help, whatever it is, in which case we find ways to generate yield with it. So that could be staking it, that could be yield farming with it, lending it and so forth. There's many ways to generate yield. So every position should be active. And then the second part is activist investing, where we say like, look, if it is a project 10 million, 50 million, they probably need some help, right? If they're still that young, they don't have all the resources. So what we do is oftentimes, you know, help them with whatever they need most help with, providing the token model, right? Creating a token model that actually generates value. They need liquidity. We are, we got in connections to a lot of like decentralized exchanges where we can like, you know, A, get them set up, get them whitelisted, and perhaps even us providing liquidity so that there's more liquidity or making introductions to other teams. We say like, hey, this portfolio project and this portfolio project could really do an integration together that generates value for both. So it's win-win. So doing those kind of things. So the way to look at the activist investing is almost like a liquid VC, because at, at the end of the day, we always do that on the open markets. We don't do it with lockups. And and that's really cool because you, you get to real time see the benefits of your work. 
you know, it's not like an eight year game, but rather with crypto, it's, it's liquid 24 seven. I mean, I understand that, you know, for portfolio sizing and risk management, you got to kind of, I guess, manage the book in percentage wise. But, you know, some of the things in the market that we've maybe seen historically over the last 10 years is that a position held with the highest conviction maybe in development over the longest period of time has probably outperformed everything else, right? Mm -hmm. What's your kind of take between those two different sides? If a position starts, let's say, in the 2 to 5% range, right? If it's 2%, it can 10x before it hits 20%. If it's 5%, it can 4x before it hits 20%. At that point, you're not killing the position, you're just clipping it, right? You're moving some. And, and the, the logic is that ideally there's other opportunities out there, right? That you then maybe add whatever you just clipped to your next highest level conviction position that might meet, need some more meat, right? Because as a result, you know, your AUM also crew. Because if, uh, let's, say nothing, if let's say everything else stood still, Everything else stood still and, and the 5% just turned into 20%. You just added 15% to AUM, which means everything else got diluted down, right? So beefing that up might actually be good. And, and really, we came up with concentration rules out of just past experience. Well, after DeFi Summer, after DeFi Summer, some of our core positions, like for example, Enzyme. Enzyme was an activist position. We got in at like $4. It ballooned to $80. 80. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like in the span of two months. So in the span of two months, like one of our core investments literally like 20 x and that time, I think we clipped it a little bit, but we, we didn't clip nearly enough. And then it ended up dropping all the way back to like, I think like $16, something like that, right? So that was a proof. like, you know, the August statement looked great. September statement looked miserable. So the reality is that like, yes, you might be cutting yourself short because like, for example, we probably would have sold some at 40, 50, 60, and it went to 80, would have been like, damn it, we shouldn't have sold. But in hindsight, in the next step, we would have been able to reuse that capital, right? So... If you take a long enough time horizon, it was a great decision too. We didn't pay tax on it and we still hold it till today. And now it's worth like $130. So it's even higher than then. But, you know, in hindsight, in that same time span, we've also generated like, like I think 900%, something like that, 800%. So like, you know, there's opportunity cost that comes with it, right? Like there's, there's opportunity cost that comes with choosing not to take profits. So it's creating a system where you can strike the balance between like letting winners run and not getting too concentrated. And you mentioned like participating in governance and communication with these projects. How important is that, you know, when it comes to deciding if you're going to make a position? How important is the part of like talking to them? Yeah. And, and how, how much are you involved on a quarterly or monthly basis with that team to kind of manage your position with what's happening? Oh, very. I mean, I mean, we're very involved, particularly like either if it's a high conviction position or if we think they really need help. For whatever reason, we're, we talk with most of our teams, I would say, either on a weekly or monthly basis. And it's so important because ultimately you're backing the founders and the team almost more than the product itself in the initial stage, right? Because ultimately the product might change, right? The product might pivot over time. And at that point, you're really betting on the founder making the most out of it, which is why it's so important that founders and teams, they need to be incentivized by the very thing you're backing, right? So that, that's where a conflict of interest can happen where there's a private entity and there's a token, right? Who is the team trying to create value for? Is it for the token or for the for the private company, right? Great example, that is Ripple. Ripple has Ripple Labs, which intended to IPO, right? And then it had Ripple token. Whose valuation I do care more about, right? And I think the SEC documents should suggest that the company, because they were dumping like $600 million worth of tokens, right? And don't quote me the number, like it's in the documents, people can look it up. But that's very important. So like on those calls, I want to make sure that is the team getting the same incentive as we have? B, is the founder that ideal mix of both visionary and hustler, right? Because lacking one of the other is, is an issue. Like we, unfortunately, we've got teams that are incredible builders, but they are just not great communicators and not really visionaries, which means that they have a much harder time selling the product. When I say selling a product, it's not just about selling a token. It's just as much about acquiring the best talent, acquiring the best partners, acquiring the best investors, right? So of course, people tend to really flock towards big examples like something like Elon, right? The best people in the world want to work for Elon, right? Everybody would want to invest in anything Elon touches, right? But at the same time, you've got to make sure that they're also builders because there's a lot of people that can talk, right? There's a lot of people that are visionaries and like they'll say crazy things that make like, wow, imagine, but they can't translate that into actual shipping product, right? So I'm not going to name names, but there's a lot of pre-launch products out there value in the billions, right? So especially in the metaverse space where there's like these crazy ideas, these crazy play to earn great games with let's say like five, eight billion market cap, but literally nothing is live. 
Why? Because they can sell the vision, right? Which means they can still pull it off. But ideally, we always invest post product. We want to see a test net. We want to see like something live on mainnet. Ideally, we can use it, right? Almost every project that we hold significant size of, we use ourselves. We try it out, right? Like that's part of the DD process. You know, back in DeFi summer, we'd use decentralized exchanges. We'd use yield protocols and so forth. And I think it helped. Like that's that's a really important piece of the due diligence because it allows you to separate the vaporware from what's actually real. Because if you can actually use the product, there's no lies. There's nothing fake about it, right? But if it's just a trailer, if it's just a mock-up, that can literally be like, you know, in a Photoshop design, right? And like, that's unusable. So that, that's always important. The de-risking is big. Yeah, you mentioned communication and kind of finding the best project within certain themes. I mean, for the listeners, you know, who may not be experienced, I mean, what are some other like key metrics, maybe five things or something that like allows you to hone in and decide on one out of the many still within that area? Yeah. Uh, a few things. So like, you know, a market, I got caps an easy one, of course, but more importantly, we're looking at things like total value locked, right? So how much value is like in a DeFi protocol, for example, how many dollars are currently trusting the smart contracts of this protocol, right? Not every protocol is created the same where sometimes a million can mean a lot, sometimes a million means nothing, right? Second, daily active users or monthly active users, you know, right? So stuff like that, you can find them doing analytics usually. We see like how many people are actually using this product. Revenue generated. Does this project actually make money, right? If it's pre-launched, the answer is obviously no. And even if it's post-launch, sometimes it's no if they don't have it turned on. And if they don't have it turned on, I want to know why they don't have it turned on, right? So there's some projects we're backing. I mean, I can, like folks have like 88 MPH. 88 MPH was something we backed recently. We already published on our blog. So, you know, it's, we're public about it. They have maybe like a $15 million market cap and they do depth launches, right? The closest competitor is the fixed income product. The closest competitor, Barnbridge, is worth like $250 million, right? So it's worth like more than 10x. It's almost 20x worth the valuation. However, the crazy thing is, is that I think Barnbridge has like $30 million in total value locked. 80 MPH has $28 million in total value locked. So they have almost the same amount of money using the products, but the valuations are up like 15x, right? So like that's something where we can see like, well, the market is paying attention to this one, but clearly nobody's using it. Where there's this one, nobody's paying attention to, but the people that pay attention to it are actual real users using the protocol. And then, you know, we use it ourselves. We play around with it. You know, one of my guys, he's a, a former fixed income hedge fund manager of 10 years. So, like, so that, that's his world. He's like, you know, this tech is actually better. So we look at, you know, market cap, total value lock, the revenue it makes, right? Actually, the 88 MPH, I think, has a P ratio. Don't, it's on the website. Don't quote me on it. It might be going back and forth between 15 to 30, maybe. So it's really low too, right? So it's, it's a product that low market cap, high usage, real revenue, right? Talk to the team had good reviews about the team from other founders, right? It was actually an introduction from another founder. So now like that, that starts checking a lot of box, live product that I can use, in fact, version three. So when you look through all that, number one, it de-risks it a lot and it keeps like underlining the thesis, like, look, this has a real chance of number one, catching up to its close competitor, which would be like a 15X, right? And then if the fixed income space exceeds, that could be massive, right? That could be billion dollar plus valuation. So at that point, you know, imagine if we have 40 of those plays, right? Every piece on our portfolio is like that, where there's such an asymmetric upside to a limited downside. And even more so the downside is fairly hedged just by the amount of research we've done and like by all the good things in favor of it. Look, out of 40, some will not succeed. Some will fail. That will happen. But the math is that even if you have 10% of those succeed in these repricings that they should be on, it's significant upside. Now, when it comes to the uh, market cap and circulating supply, do you have an opinion on, you know, some projects have a small current, you know, circulating supply versus the total? I'm a very, very big believer. And I think this is fairly contrarian in, in fully diluted valuation. So I always look at what's called FDV, fully diluted valuation, considering that every token, even locked up, is taken into consideration. Why? Because you should look at FDV, I think, let's say with a five-year time horizon. Maybe things after five years don't matter as much. But they do to a degree that because like the person, it might be a team member that is unlocked today, but it has more coming over the next five years. Like let's, let's say it's five years from like over 10 years, right? Somebody has a 10 year vesting, which is rare, but the bottom line is you're more encouraged to sell what you currently have if it's a high FTV when you have more coming. Because the, the way to understand void loot valuation is that what we're talking about is more supply entering the system, right? And if the fully diluted valuation is worth, let's say, 
10 billion dollars and the circulating market cap is only 10 million dollars right so the circulating analyst might say oh this is cheap let's get in <laughs> right the fully diluted valuation analyst will say 10 billion this is insane this is already super duper high right what that means though is that if the team owns say 25 percent the team all of a sudden is sitting on a wealth of like 250 million dollars which means as their tokens unlock they're very likely to you know, take some profits. Early investors are very, very likely to take some profits, right? So you're constantly batting, battling against the selling pressure or equally, a lot of times, this, how does this, this supply enter the market, usually for, through farming, right? So there's yield farmers, meaning people, for those that are not familiar with these terms, yield farming is a lot of these are liquidity protocols. Liquidity meaning if you want to buy or sell it, you need to provide some of the native token and you need to provide some Ethereum, for example, or stable coin, right? In, like in return for providing this liquidity, they're being rewarded with free tokens for their work, so to say. And what a lot of farmers do is they farm to sell, right? They farm and they sell the rewards and then do more of it and do more of it and do more of it. And that's why when you look at a lot of these projects that have these anomalies, they've performed horribly. So two big famous examples, I think, are Curve. When Curve first launched, I think they had like a $50 billion fully diluted valuation. It was like, are you guys crazy, right? And Curve has sold off tremendously from it. Another famous one was, I think, Filecoin, which I think when it launched, <laughs> don't quote me on this, had like a 200 to 500 billion market cap. I think when Filecoin launched, there was like a moment when it was worth more than Bitcoin. And I'm like, look, I mean, I don't care. For me, fully would matters. Why? Because the second some of these early investors unlock, they'll sell. Why? Because whoever invests into Filecoin, let's say at a $50 million valuation, right? And now it's at 500 billion, is sitting on such a ridiculous amount of money, they will want to realize the wallet's there, right? And ultimately, FTV always becomes true. So, and I think a lot of times, unfortunately, I think some teams abuse the circulating supply to trick people into thinking it's cheap when it's not, right? Because they, like, they slowly plead it out, right? They slowly plead out those coins and cause liquidity. But I think it's, while this market has its own valuations, I think it's so, so important to still look outside the space and say, okay, look, let's step out to the crypto bubble for a second. Would this project really be worth even one tenth of what we valued at in the crypto space. If no, then stay away because look, there's ultimately other investing opportunities, right? I've seen like pre-products, pre-anything with like a slide deck trying to raise like at a hundred million valuation. I'm like, sorry, like you can literally invest into AI or space companies for one tenth of valuation, you know, just because your crypto does not make you more valuable, which is why, you know, it does take us looking at, let's say 20 projects to find one or two that we like. And you mentioned publishing about one of the projects. You guys, do you share and publish reports regularly or yeah we have a weekly newsletter where we talk about the markets and then we have a weekly blog where we talk about more our theses some of our investments so for example when we when we make a bigger investment we usually publish a thesis why we did it so for example when we backed enzyme you know we published a, a thesis like this is why we're backing it. this is why we believe it will dominate the on-chain asset management space when we backed 88 ph we said like look we're, we're getting into the fixed income space that launches here's why we think it's better than others or when we started investing really actively into privacy, here's our private thesis. Here's why we think privacy matters. You know, it's some of the players we're betting on, right? So you can follow that on our website. You mentioned Enzyme fund management, correct? Mm -hmm. What do you see as the hurdles with that protocol and the US regulations? And is there just applications that are going to be built on top that are going to kind of uh, do all the KYC, you know, uh, do all the compliance work, kind of execute the PPM, or how do you see that play out in the US? Yeah. So, like a lot of DeFi, you know, Enzyme itself, it's a protocol, it's a network, it's infrastructure. How you use it is up to the individual investor, individual user, and also up to the individual jurisdiction, right? The way I would comment on that is that I would say people could use the Enzyme infrastructure and build their own UI for it. If they want to build a US-based UI with like integrated KYC, they can, right? In fact, I think one of our one of our community teams is actually building something for that. Gorilla Funds, they received a grant from the Enzyme Council to build something that allows you to digitally do KYC, to have a fund page and so forth, right? So what Enzyme really aims to do like long-term is automate the whole fund process where you don't need administrators. Why? Because it's literally administered digitally on smart contracts, right? You don't need auditors. Why? Because the Ethereum blockchain is the one that audits you, right? And so like, you know, as it's progressing more and more, that will be automated, digitalized, and of course can be made fit to different jurisdiction. Although that's not the, it's not the prerogative of the council itself yeah. because our primary job is to create the protocol. And then there's outside teams 
that can, you know, make it fit with, let's say, the EU jurisdiction, the US jurisdiction, right? And then, like already now, Enzyme allows you to whitelist wallets, which means like if you do not want to accept money from strangers, you can already now, like say, like, I only want to accept money from people that I know. Like, so for example, you do your PPM with me, you do your subscription documents with me externally, like offline, I can now whitelist your wallet, and you can invest with me. So again, like I would look at more from a perspective of infrastructure than a product. Well, that's interesting. I mean, we did do a little research on that. And that's kind of what we found is that there's still in development and there's a gap in the ability for some people to build on top of that. Well, you could, so for example, like if you wanted to launch an enzyme fund today, you know, you, you can literally do it within like 90 seconds, right? It takes a few Ethereum transactions and now you have a vehicle, right? Again, looking at it as an infrastructure piece, you now have a vehicle that is able to accept money in a non-custodial way where the investors keep access to the funds, right? You have no ability to withdraw the money. You have no ability to spend the money. You can only direct it, right? So there's these interactive poker accounts that allow you to you know, manage other people's money without like touching it, right? So the enzyme does the same thing. So now you're able to manage it. You're able to charge a performance fee for it. You're able to trade it, stake it, lend with it. You can do everything in DeFi as a manager, right? And the, the beautiful part for the investors is they don't have to trust you as much anymore as in a traditional world. In a traditional world, they have to hope that you're not a fraudster. You're not going to run over the money. You're not going to spend the money in weird ways. And it's real-time reporting, right? Traditional funds report maybe monthly. With Enzyme, it's real-time reporting, right? The, the investors can see on Enzyme how the fund is performing. And if they say, hey, I want to redeem, they can redeem every day. So it's, you know, I think if you take that three-year horizon, I think there's no way that the asset management space will not use Enzyme because ultimately, right now, the space that I still operate in, traditional fund management, is slow. It's monthly reporting. It takes a very long time. It's super manual, like old school accounting, right? Accepting money, right? Like first it's to be wired into bank account. And because of large sums, people have to go to the bank, right? People spend like two hours in the bank trying to do it. Well, with Enzyme, people literally send money to the smart contract. They make the investment. They generate their investment token. They get proof on the on chain that they're an investor. And next day, the investment starts. So it's just a lot easier. And then when you do the math, look, what if every, every public company uses it for treasury management? What if Every fund uses it for running the fund. What if every DAO in you know, central autonomous organization uses Enzyme? It's just a massive, massive market for that. I agree. I agree. And so let's roll into the market cycle, right? Mm -hmm. And also start off with maybe managing cash yep. in the fund and kind of how do you create best practices around that to take advantage of positions when the cycle turns? Sure. You know, I think risk management comes in in a few ways, three big ways. I think the first big way, and that the one's underappreciated, is actual asset selection. There is a lot of defense in smart offense. What I mean by that is if you look at the most recent pullback in April, May, and June, if you had a good diversification and asset allocation, you may not have suffered that much of a drawdown. Why? Because you've had a couple of big winners. Axe Infinity went from $3 to like $60 in the time spent when Bitcoin and ETH dropped. You had Luna go from $4 to $40 in a time when Bitcoin and ETH stood still, right? So a few of these smart allocations in your portfolio can actually hedge the entire portfolio because the matter is following. If you have, let's say you have 10 positions, right? Nine of them lose 10%. And then you have Luna putting in a 10X, right? So minus 10 on 90 means you lost 9%. 10X on 10% means you made 10%. So now all of a sudden you actually ended that time period at plus 1%, even though 90% of your portfolio lost money, right? So I think... That's where asset selection, active management makes a lot of sense. And actually, like that's where the real alpha comes from. And then for more really active hedging, we do two things. One, I think derivatives are a valuable tool. So for example, like, you know, buying puts, buying puts to protect the downside, because the reality is, I hate this from altcoins, but, you know, small cap assets, let's call that small cap assets are harder to navigate in and out of, right? Especially like if you, if you manage a significant part of supply like us, you know, if you, if you own 2% of a network, 2% of a network, you can't just put in a stop and like, oh, wow, you know. So instead, the way to really hedge risk is to hedge market risk, right? So you can do that by buying puts on Bitcoin or Ethereum, for example. And then the third one is what you mentioned, cash management, right? But that's something to be very conscious of because holding cash is making the choice of not putting it somewhere else, right? So holding cash is something that it's really reserved for when I have really an awful time and can't find anything that's investable, right? Or when I say the market is so overheated that I want to hold 10, 20, 30% in cash, right? So for example, I did have a good cash position in March 
because there were so many red flags. The ARS, I think, was the highest level in, in its history. You had sentiment wise, the, the Bitcoin fear and creed index was at like 99. It was like insanely high. You had all kinds of celebrities, you know, making tweets about it, you know. So there was enough red flags. We said, okay, you know what? If there was ever time to hold cash, now is probably one of them, right? So we held puts, we held cash, makes sense. Right now, you know, I don't think holding cash makes that much sense when I have several opportunities in the 10 million, 50 million market cap range where, and they're making money. So if they're making money and they load that low, there's a certain floor there and strong founders, they're not going to go anywhere. So if I think the diversification hedge is much smarter than sitting on cash, but the problem is in crypto, it happens all too often. In if there's a directional rally where everything doubles or triples, well, now if you're sitting, if you buy back, your risk profile actually becomes so much worse, right? There's a lot of people that said, oh, with Bitcoin, for example, they bought Bitcoin at eight thousand dollars, it rallies to fifteen thousand. They say, oh, I want to take some off the table. I'm going to have it in cash. Well, then Bitcoin rallies on to sixty thousand. Like, is that cash position now going to sit there forever? If you ever choose to go get back in, so for example, you sold at fifteen, now you're getting back in at even if you bought the dip at 30,000, you still doubled your cost basis, right? Which is why I think it's so much smarter to just constantly rebalance to things that are undervalued. All right. So what's your take on kind of tax implications and does that have any impact on your decisions, on your positions? Yeah. So, you know, funny enough, I used to not worry about it that much. And I think funny enough, even my auditors, my, my tax admins told me that, you know, you don't want to let the tax tail wag the dog, right? So like, don't let taxes get in the way of smart decision making, because the reality is, yes, a short-term capital gain might hit you at 35 to 40%, but crypto assets can also drop 80%, right? So that's literally the decision you have to make. If the expected drawdown is potentially more than say 30%, then it's something you surely want to close, right? So we see that with parabolic runs, right? If, if, if there's a parabolic run, you've made your gains and it seems like it's going to break, it's very smart to exit, even if it realizes short-term capital gain. But if it's something you say like, look, we're still 5X, 3X away from our actual target. And I'm, I am expecting a 20% pullback, but I would want to get back in later. I probably don't close. Why? Because me closing short-term realize a 40% capital gain. Also, maybe my timing is off. Maybe it keeps on running, right? In which case now I missed the actual 3X upside. And let's say I time it perfectly. Yes, I reduce my cost base, I get back in cheaper, but I also realized that 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 capital gain of, let's say 40%, whereas if I waited, if I was able to manage that position throughout the span of a year, now the tax basis literally gets cut in half, you know, from roughly 40 to roughly 20. So I very much changed on that. And I think one way to change on that too is by portfolio composition, because in the past, my portfolio looked a lot, was a lot more concentrated, like maybe, you know, five, 20% positions, right? The problem is if one of them puts in a 10X, well, first of all, awesome, because you made a lot of money, but also, yeah. you know, now it's 20 turns into 200, of course, not going to be 20%, but like, it's going to be a massive, massive part of the portfolio. And then if you have an 80% pullback, it really does damage. But now that I say, Hey, I start my positions at three to 5% and I've got 40 of them, right? Even if it grows and it's now 10%, I'm happy to let it run at 10%. If it's 15, happy to let it run at 15. And then if we do get really, really high, first of all, fantastic. It was a big winner. But then if it's, let's say 25%, if I take 5% of the table, not only do I realize more than I ever invested at that point, right? Yeah. But also, A, it frees up more bullets. And again, at least the remaining 20% can stay active and grow to at least a year plus. So the reality is, is that, you know, I think as a normal fund, you, you shouldn't worry too much about it. But if you're actually performing in the triple digit annual return, right? If you're making 100, 200, 300, 400, 500% ROI, and you have to liquidate 40% of that to pay taxes, that can, I think, can be operationally very damaging to a fund. Because then, you know, like all the investors say like, oh shit, you know, I got this massive tax bill, can I redeem some, <laughs> right? And that's something you certainly want to avoid. And planning it for the portfolio, how important is market cycles and kind of what do you think is going to happen from here on out? Yeah. So uh, recently I was on Real Vision and on Real Vision, I, my perspective was that we're halfway through the market and that still feels very accurate. I think when I say halfway through the market, uh, market cycle though, I really mean it more in terms of price action, not in time. In terms of time, I think when the last 20 to 25%, if, if we follow traditional cycle phases, right? But that means that the other half of performance is still left. So that means, for example, Bitcoin going from 50,000 to maybe 200, 250, 300,000, right? In my eyes, if and when we break the highs of, I think it was like $62,000, there will be another parabolic run because there's a lot of people 
that sold early because they got burned in 2017. And they said, like, I'm not going to be the one holding the back this time. I'm going to be the one that sells the top. I'm going to get out early. <laughs> and then there was the ones that panic sold at 30 because like, oh no, it's happening again. Not, not again, not again, right? But here we are. It's holding fairly strong at 55. You know, we keep making higher lows, higher lows. And when you look at UTXO analysis, which is the actual on-chain analysis, you can see that long-term holders are not selling. There's fewer Bitcoin and short-term holder hands than ever before. It informed me that I think the market structure is healthy, which means that I think the moment we go and make a new all-time high, like 64,000, there will be a lot of people saying, damn it, this wasn't the top. I need to get a bit back in ASAP. So I very much think there can be one more big FOMO rally if we follow cycle structure and we go to the 200, 350,000 range, which means altcoins will grow significantly more as well. That's if we follow all structures. But And you'll see when it happens. I mean, if there's a parabolic run and everybody goes crazy again, you know that's what's happening, right? Because ultimately, parabolic runs never can go on forever because parabolic runs in the final stages of them, they're making like 20% a day, which means if you forecast and say like, if we stay this way for another week or month, (laughs) it will overleap the entire equity world, right? That's probably not going to happen like right now this year. It will happen long-term, but not right now this year. So it's probably time to like, you know, take the foot of the gas. But... I also very much subscribed to the super cycle. And here's why. I actually wrote about the super, super cycle maybe six months ago, where it's look, we're in a super cycle. And, and here's why. Traditionally, cycles end because investors get bored, right? Cycles start because there's a zero to one moment. There's something new that captures people's attention, right? In 2017, it was ICOs. Who? what is this new thing? A new funding mechanism, tokens. It's a whole new asset class, right? Drew so much money in. Right. And it drove prices up, which just reaffirmed like, oh, price going up. People make money. I want to invest too. I want to invest too. I want to invest too. And so what happens? People got disillusioned. People got bored because they saw like, you know, there's billions of dollars in this market now, but there's no live products. There's nothing shipped. All we have is white papers and promises. Right. And then make it worse because the fundraising was so easy. You attract bad players, bad apples, which start losing people money. So like all of a sudden, you know, if innovation and making money drew people in, all of a sudden losing money and the lack of innovation is what's making people leave, right? But then what happens the next three years? Well, there's billions of dollars. There's a lot of talented people. They'll build something. And that building something leads to, aha, the next year to one moment, the next innovation. And this cycle, we've had two so far, I would say DeFi in some of last year that made people go, wow, this is new. This has never been done before. This is huge. I want to invest in it. Right. And the second one was, I would say, NFTs, right? Uh, NFTs was also a big aha moment for people like this is an entirely new medium, right? And this medium can change entire industries. It's massive. Like, again, both DeFi and NFTs were literally trillion dollar potential markets, multi trillion dollar potential markets with like 11 figure market caps, right? So it's like tens of billions of market cap versus trillion dollar opportunity. Massive. People jump in, people go crazy. Now, What makes it different, and why I believe in a super cycle, is that in the past, investors would get bored and they would leave. Now, there's so many different opportunities in crypto that they just go somewhere else. People got bored of DeFi. They didn't leave crypto. They just went to NFTs and metaverses, right? People started slowly getting bored of NFTs. Where did they go? Layer ones, right? Web3. They said like, oh, let me take a look at Avalanche. Let me take a look at Solana. Let me take a look at Terra, right? And so people are rotating now more than leaving, Right. And the great thing that that does is it buys the market time, right? Because by the time people get bored of Web3, A, there might be another niche like maybe private finance or DWeb, or DeFi had a whole year to build, right? DeFi had a whole year to build to mature, to launch new products, new things that now investors say, oh, let me take a look at DeFi again and let me allocate some more projects there, right? So that maturing of the market, this ability to have subsectors is removing some of this really artificial and painful pace that's just not sustainable, right? Because we always grow this insane pace, product and teams can't keep up, bear market. New innovation, bull market. But now it's just like, you know, there are these thematic waves, but at least we buy it enough time where people never have to leave the crypto ecosystem. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a little bit more boom and bust. I mean, kind of like this year, right? I look at some of these DeFi projects, some are down 95%. I mean, some are down 50%. And that was towards the beginning of the year. And I don't know what will happen by the end of this year, but there's definitely maybe a bigger time frame in which the next season's happening compared to maybe back in 17, where there, you know, it's a little bit tighter. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think, you know, the, the, the really great thing in my eyes is that we had this massive pullback, 50%, 60%, 80% on some in 
April, May. And all that hype and sentiment that was really concerning to me in March is gone. I mean, back in March, you had people promote, you know, Dogecoin, Shiba Inu, and some names I can't even name on the show, right? Um, like, it was just incredible. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, are we already at the top? This was too soon, right? All that dirty sentiment, so to say, has been wiped off and went back to building and price appreciation, which is great because that means the short-term holders have been shaken out. The speculators have been mostly shaken out. And we're still on very good ground, on still good footing, seeing most assets making new highs compared to where they were in March. That's good. I mean, this has been a good interview. So let's yeah. leave off with one final question. And maybe the biggest thing you have implemented in your life that has helped increase your net worth. The biggest thing I've implemented to increase my net worth. I would say it's two things. It's brand and leverage. So when I say brand, it's why do teams want to work with me? Brand. Why do investors trust me with their money? Brand. And leverage is the fund itself, right? Like I could have made a lot of money in, in crypto one way or the other, mm. but you know, setting up a vehicle like a fund is just ultimate leverage because you know, now I'm able to raise money every single month, right? Doing the same work I would otherwise do, right? The same investments, but I give others the opportunity to invest alongside me and I'm able to make a cut off of it. And that gives you so much acceleration that individual messages are very unlikely to have. That's good. I totally agree there. Building, I mean, you're, you're building a brand, right? Yep. Any listener wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? Three interesting ways to get involved. One is sign up to our newsletter. Every single week we put out just market commentary. There's absolutely zero sales or anything. It's just like letting you know what's going on in the market, sharing some of our thesis. If you just go to our website, hartmancapital.com slash content, that's the blog, but then also there's a sign up for our sub stack, which gets delivered to your email. Those are two separate ones. So check that out. And then, you know, crypto is very big on Twitter. So if you follow me on Twitter, you'll learn quite a few of my, you know, just like random insights and comments. And finally on Instagram, I try to do like one live stream a month, maybe one live stream every two weeks where I just do Q and A and I'll answer questions about the market. I appreciate it, Felix, sharing that and having you on today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hey everyone. Thanks for watching my latest interview. If you like what you saw, please click the subscribe button below to become a member of the Joe Robert community. Be sure to hit the bell to turn on all notifications so you always know when I post a new video. Tell me what you thought about the content in the comments below. I always read them and would love to answer any of your questions.